Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar with Fullscript and Cure Life. My name is Kaylee. I am part of the marketing team here at Fullscript, and we're very excited to have Cure Life and Professor Itamar Raz with us here today. Um, before we get into the presentation, a little housekeeping to go through first, a reminder that this is being recorded. So everyone who registered will get um, access to the recording through their email, as well as um, all our webinars live on fullscript.com slash webinars. So you can always go back and find it there as well. Um, we will provide any um, resources we can as well in the follow-up, so you'll have access to everything. Um, this webinar is slightly different as well, as we have a presentation from Professor Raz, but he will also be joining us for a live Q&A at the end of the presentation. So if you have questions throughout, um, please add them to the question section on your um, GoToWebinar dashboard, and we'll get to sit down with Professor Raz at the end. Um, so yes, I'd like to thank you all for taking the time to be here today. And as I said, we have Cure Life and Professor Itamar Raz here with us today. Cure Life is a company that blends modernized Asian Ayurveda principles with modern day science and technology. They created a 100% natural glucose support supplement called Curelin for people looking to maintain healthy blood sugar levels and enjoy life to the fullest. And Professor Raz is Cure Life's medical advisory board chairman and one of the top diabetologists in the world. He is the head of the Israel National Council for, of Diabetes and the founder and head of the National Diabetes Prevention and Care Plan in Israel. He has over 320 publications in peer-reviewed journals and headed the diabetes unit at Hadassah University Hospital from 2000 to 2015. So with that being said, I'm going to let you listen to um, Professor Raz and then we'll both join you later for a live Q&A. Good day to you all. I am Professor Rita Maraz. I am the head of the National Council of Diabetes in Israel. It's a great pleasure to have you with us today. I want to thank Fullscript Natural Partners and Cura Life for inviting me to give this lecture today. I'm going to talk with you about breakthrough in diabetes care. And this is my disclosure. I want to tell you the story of the last 13 years of, diabetes, of drug for diabetes, the development of drug for diabetes. It started in 2008 when the FDA have required that every new drug that will be developed in order to treat diabetic patients, mainly to reduce sugar, glucose, will do a study that will show its cardiovascular safety. And this was because in 2008, 2007, there were several studies, mainly meta-analysis, the big one by Nissen, suggesting that thiazolidine dions, Avandia, and maybe others, can be deleterious to the heart, can increase the risk for cardiovascular events. And for this reason, from that day on, any new drug in the market has to show its cardiovascular safety. The first studies were done on a family of drugs called DPP-4 inhibitors. I was the leader of one of these studies, the SAVOR studies, and surprisingly, we have demonstrated that treating with DPP-4 inhibitor might increase your risk for heart failure. Later on, two families of studies have been developed, very, very good drugs, two family of drugs. One is a drug that called SGLT2, sodium glucose transporter inhibitor, a drug that should increase the amount of sugar that we lose in the urine, and at the same time can protect the heart and the kidney. And those studies came in order to show that it's not deleterious to the heart or to the kidney. Another family of drug, GLP-1 agonist, a drug that 
not only reduce weight, reduce sugar, reduce blood pressure, but also can uh, improve or reduce cardiovascular event, but the studies actually looked primarily at the safety of those drugs. And what was shown by this drug was, as I mentioned, this drug reduced uh, weight, reduced blood pressure, reduced uh, glucose for sure, and are very, uh, have a high, very high safety. But what was shown, that this drug not only have a high safety margin, they also have a high efficacy margin. And I want to mention again that the effect of this drug was, came through their effect on different uh, parameters that may, most of the time are not well controlled in diabetic patients. And we are talking about high lipids, high blood pressure, a tendency to hypercoagulability and hyperglycemia. But not only this, this drug do not only reduce this, they also reduce the cardiovascular events. Now, we know that there is a very great relationship between the kidney and the heart. When there is a kidney disease, you see much more heart disease. When there is a heart disease, you see many more patients with kidney disease. And we know today that when you have kidney disease, it will affect the heart. And when you have a heart disease, it will affect the kidney. So it was reasonable to assume that if a drug will protect the heart, it would also protect the kidney, either separately or by one that will protect the other. And I want to concentrate and talk to you about the SGLT2 inhibitor, a drug that increases the amount of sugar that we lose in the kidney. This drug, as I mentioned, will also decrease obesity, dec decrease weight, improve blood pressure, improve uh, blood glucose, and reduce the risk for hypoglycemia. But this drug also has other effects. We know that in diabetes, we have natrium retention, hypervolemia. We have hyperactivation of the RAS system. We have hyperactivation of the neuronumeral system. We have increase in inflammation, increase in ischemia, and reduce energetic for the heart. SGLT2 inhibitor improve all those parameters. So beyond its effect to reduce blood pressure, to reduce glucose, to, to reduce any other risk factor like obesity, it has a direct effect on the heart and on the kidney. And I want to show you the study that I was leading together with a Timmy group in Boston. And because this was the largest study that actually looked at most of the diabetic patients. We took 17,160 patients around the world, 33 countries, and 880 clinics. And we looked at patients who have type 2 diabetes, who either have established cardiovascular disease, around 7,000 patients, or those who only have one more risk factor beyond diabetes, like hypertension, like smoking, like high lipids, mainly including nearly every diabetic patient. So we have now 17,160 diabetic patients randomized either to dapagliflozin, a drug, an SGLT2 drug, or to placebo, and we followed them for a mean of 4.2 years. And look what we found. We found that treatment with dapagliflozin have reduced tremendously the combination of cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. Its main effect was to reduce hospitalization 
for heart failure by nearly 30%. But we also show that it reduced the risk for renal deterioration to end-stage renal disease by nearly 50%. And this was a fantastic finding of this drug that was related not to the reduction of glucose or blood pressure or anything else, but a direct effect of the drug on the heart and on the kidney. Just to show you, if we look at the effect of the drug on the kidney of the diabetic patient, the effect was similar whether the patient had heart disease or not. It was similar whether they have heart failure or not. And surprisingly, it was similar even if their kidney function test was totally normal, meaning that this drug is also a protective drug. If you give it to a patient who has normal uh, kidney function and no heart failure, you protect him from this too at the future if you give it before it happened. Further on, studies have demonstrated that this can be reduced even in patient with prediabetes or normal patient. So in a study that contained 45% of diabetic patient, 48% of pre-diabetic patient, and 7% of patients without diabetes or pre-diabetes, and the only thing they had was renal failure, look what it shown. It shown improvement or prevention of deterioration to end-stage renal disease of about 40%. But it also showed reduction in cardiovascular mortality or total mortality of 30%. Meaning that this drug can be a very effective drug not only for diabetes, but also for prediabetes. Because of that, different groups in the world, and here I show you the kidney group, World Kidney Group, have suggested that patients with diabetes should start to be treated with combination therapy of metformin and SGLT2 inhibitor. Dapagliflozin seems to be the best of them all. And if we try to summarize it, we can say that SGLT2 has a renal protection and heart failure protection in nearly every diabetic patient and also prevent cardiovascular events like MI and CVA in patients who have established cardiovascular disease. Further on, as I mentioned, it was shown that also in patients without diabetes, most of them have pre-diabetes. This drug can prevent heart failure and this drug can prevent kidney deterioration in patients who already have a story of heart failure or kidney problem. Now, I want to remind you that diabetes, the first thing it is, the first problem is high sugar, high glucose. And this was a little bit forgotten because the cardiologists and nephrolo nephrologists said, well, if we have drug that can prevent cardiovascular event and we have drug that can prevent renal event without the relationship to reduction of glucose, maybe we don't have to put so much effort in reduction of glucose. But this is wrong. We have to remember that if we want to prevent microvascular disease of the eye, of the kidney, of the nerves, what we have to do is to concentrate on glycemic control, reduction of obesity, reduction of lipids, reduction of blood pressure. And what I want to show you is that when you look at the relationship between A1C and, and ischemic heart disease, you can see that patients who have A1C of five or five and a half, which is normal, have about half the event of what you can find in patients who have 
diabetes or pre-diabetes, meaning that we should aim to normalize blood glucose of our patient also if we want to prevent cardiovascular disease. In a very large study, the SABRE study that I have done, I have the principal investigator again together with a team. We have demonstrated that if your A1C is above nine, your risk to develop cardiovascular events or death is more than double than that if you have seven and surely if you have less than seven. So this brought researcher to try and do studies where you try to normalize your blood glucose level. The first one, UKPDS, have demonstrated that reduction of A1C from eight to seven can you reduce your risk to cardiovascular events by about 15%. However, later on, large studies like ACCORD and advance of more than 10,000 people with disease duration of about 10 years have failed to show an improvement on the cardiovascular events. Moreover, if you look at the ACCORD study, trying to control your blood glucose level to normalize it, when you reduce it from A1C to 7.4 in the control group to 6.5 in the intervention group, what you can see was that there was an increase of 23% in mortality from insulin. And in general, using insulin in all the studies, increased weight of the patient dramatically and increase the risk of hypoglycemia dramatically. So we learned from these studies that aiming at normal glycemia could kill the patient and many times will not be of any advantage when it comes to prevention of cardiovascular disease. Now, why does it happen? It happened because up till now, the way we used to, do, to treat patients was to give one drug to reduce their A1C to seven or less, and then wait. And if A1C to increase to seven and a half or eight, we would add another drug and so on. So all the time, sugar goes up and down, up and down, up and down, and most of the time, we're not below seven and a half. So if we look at it another way, you can see that a patient who starts with diabetes with eight and a half, and goes down to let's say seven or seven and a half, will have actually high glucose level all the time during 10 years of follow-up, most probably much more than 10 years because many times we start treatment very late after diabetes is first, there is a sign of diabetes. So even if we reduce blood glucose from eight and a half to seven as we did in the VADT study, the, la the last study, this is too late because already the patient have a lot of glucose in his blood for many, many years. So he will develop all the complication. And if we now try to reduce blood glucose mainly by insulin, what we cause is weight gain, hypoglycemia, a lot of work and, and hard time for the patient without achieving actually anything. And just to show you, there were several studies, I want to show you one of them, that followed 35,000 diabetic patients from the moment that they were diagnosed for mean of 10 years. And this is a prospective retrospective study that looked at what was your A1C at the first year or second year and what was your first A1C at the first year and second year? And how does it relate to cardiovascular outcome and events and microvascular events? And what you can see here, that if your A1C in the first year and second year was six and a half to seven, your risk for microvascular events was much, much smaller than if it was eight to nine or even nine or more. And even cardiovascular disease, your risk to develop events were much smaller 
if your A1C was six and a half to seven, and if it was less than six and a half, even smaller. So for years, there were people who said that if you want to keep your blood glucose control below six and a half, and you want to keep it for long, you need to use combination therapy. And a study done by Professor DiFronzo have shown that if you use triple therapy versus placebo, first you can decrease your patient sugar much more, but much more important than this, you can keep the A1C much lower for long. So if you look after two years, only 10% of the patient who were under six and a half lost it and was above, while there were 35% of the patient already who were below six and a half at the beginning of the study, but lost it after two years. So one more thing that we learn is the need for combination therapy. And we have our own National Council Diabetes Guideline, which is a simple guideline. This is a guideline for general practitioner, family physician, and even very important for patients who treat diabetes. And what we say is that beyond the fact that you have to do life modification, you have to teach your patient to eat properly, to do exercises needed and so on. Beyond that, you need medicine. And most of the time, you start with a combination therapy of metformin and SGLT2. Sometimes you can choose the GLP-1. But what happens in many of our patients is that first, many of them cannot use SGLT2 because of its side effect. This drug have a side effect, can be not so good for old men who have benign hypertrophy of the prostate. For women, it can cause genital infection. So it's a very good drug, but it's limited because of its side effect. And not only this, sometimes you use two drugs or even three drugs, and yet you don't get to the level that we want so much to the, uh, a, to the H1C of less than six and a half. So in this regard, we need other drugs. The problem is that all the other drugs are deleterious, as I shown to you. Thiazolidinedione can increase your weight and have cause edema, cause anemia, cause fractures, and so on. Sulfonylurea, drugs that are used in 40% of the population, diabetic population in the United States, can cause hypoglycemia, weight gain, or might be deleterious for the heart. So today we are looking for drugs or supplements that can replace those drugs if the new drug will not be enough. And in this regard, I want to discuss with you the Curaline, which is a fantastic supplement. And I want to think together with you about the place of supplement in the treatment of type 2 diabetes. So what we did with Curaline, we were looking backward at patients who were using the drug for more than a year or more than 18 months. And we asked them many questions, 11 questions. Out of 8,000 people to whom the questionnaire was sent, more than 700 answered. And I want to show you what was their answer. In general, what the answer was, do you feel safe with the drug? 98% say yes. What about hypoglycemia? Did you, are you afraid from it? Did you suffer hypoglycemia? There was hypoglycemia. However, don't forget that most of these patients were treated with other drugs like insulin, sulfonylurea. And if we look at severe hypoglycemia, there were only six cases. And when we looked too deeply, there were not 
They didn't have any connection to the supplement. Another question was about, do you feel safe? The answer was yes, in actually 98% of the patients. What do you think about the efficacy of the supplement? Do you think the A1C reduction has to do with the use of Curaline? 85% yes, said yes for sure. So in general, we can say that we have, at least for questionnaire, a supplement that is very effective, has a very high safety margin. The people who use it we recommend it to others. And indeed, we see more and more people who are using this supplement. What I want to tell you about myself is that seeing this data, I started to treat my patient with the drug, with the supplement. And what I can tell you, it was amazing to see that about 50 people who received it had hardly had side effects. We had minimal people with side effects. Loved this supplement. Some of them stopped other drugs. Many of them that we couldn't control with all the drugs we have, including sulfonylurea, were now controlled. And we are now doing a study in my clinic on 30 patients, 15 versus 15 randomized, blind randomized control study to show the effect of this fantastic supplement. However, I want to discuss with you a larger study that is now start to take in place in Israel. But before we do that, I want to show you the summary of the safety. And the summary of the safety is you can see that there is no side effects mentioned by most of the patient. And more than this, if you look at the side effect mentioned by 31, 39, you can see that the only two that you can maybe have a connection to it is diarrhea, skin rash. There were some that sort of talk about upset stomach. We know that it might cause an upset stomach because patients are not, this is the first time that patients are exposed to part, to part of this supplement. However, even when we patient had some side effect, most of the time they passed within a very short time. So let's look at the study of Curaline and what I forgot to mention is that I use myself this supplement, and although I'm already taking SGLT2 and 2 metformin, and I see the very big difference between using it and not using it in the control of my own glucose. So just to refresh your memory, uh, you can see here the name of the active Integrants. Actually, we're talking about eight of them. Known, known to affect blood glucose level, either through improving of beta cell function or reducing of insulin resistance or both. So this is going to be a phase two study, including 100 Six, 120 patients, 60 in each arm, in which we will treat half of them with the supplement, with Puraline, and half of them with placebo. Patient will have to give an informed concern. They will be type 2 diabetic patient with A1C of 7.5 to 10% with BMI of 25, stable body weight, and treated with anti-diabetic medication, except insulin. They will be treated with two capsules of the supplement after each uh, meal. 
in general, two weeks of running, three months of either placebo or the supplement, and then another three months using the supplement in the two groups. And this is a summary of how it will look. You can see that there will be a run-in time, and then people will be treated with either Curaline or placebo for three months, and after that, another three months of the supplement. To all the patients, this will not be already a blinded study, as you can guess. So I want to thank you very much, and I want to tell you why I'm very excited about this supplement or supplement in general. What we see today is that we have a fantastic drug to control diabetes. This drug reduces weight, reduces blood pressure, improves other variables of the diabetes, and reduces sugar. However, not every one of our patients is able to use this drug. And not only this, these drugs in many of our patients will not bring them to, the, to normalize their blood glucose level, to have an A1C of less than six and a half. And the other drugs that we have, as I mentioned, have deleterious effects. So a supplement like Uraline or others that will be as effective as the drugs, but without the side effect of the drug, can have a great, great advantage. The other thing is, people who follow patients with diabetes and who are not an MD are not allowed to change drugs, to add, to stop, but Many people, many teens who follow diabetic patients can add supplement. And adding this supplement has no safety problem on the one hand. On the other hand, it can bring a great, great change in the level of glucose and the health of the diabetic patient. So what we learned is that we should put more emphasis on supplement, on develop of supplement, in order to have more tools to reduce blood glucose of our patient to A1C of less than six and a half, if possible, less than 5.7, without the need for drug that can be deleterious for this patient. Thank you very much. All right, that was a great presentation, a lot of valuable information. And we have Professor Raz with us here right now. Welcome, thank you for joining us. Thank you, my pleasure. All right, we have a few questions that have um, come through. I'm sure more, yeah, I already see more coming in as, uh, as we go. Um, so one of the first ones actually um, I got through an email before we even started um, is, I have many patients with high fasting blood sugars, but normal A1C and insulin resistance scores. How would you treat this? Well, uh, about 40% of the diabetic population, mainly at the, when, when you first diagnose them or for the first several years, have high fast blood glucose level. This happens because of the increase of secretion of different hormones that tends to raise blood glucose level in the morning. Uh, it's not so easy to control fast blood plasma glucose level. Many times you need long-acting insulin for that. However, as much as we know from studies that have been done up till now, if your A1C is near normal or normal, with high fast blood glucose level, most probably, most probably, uh, you are at a very low risk uh, 
uh, to develop micro or macrovascular complication. I just want to mention one study, the original or original study that used uh, Lantus. This was the long acting insulin. It was more than 10,000 people divided into half of them with Lantus, half of them without. The mean blood glucose level at the beginning was more than 140. Those on Lantus was reduced to less than 110 in more than 75% of them. Those on the placebo stayed around 140. Eight years of follow-up and even further follow-up didn't show any difference in cardiovascular events, microvascular events, or mortality. So what I tend to do most of the time is to try and control it with drugs. I think this drug that I use myself, which is called Curaline, that I talked about it, uh, might do part of the job, but most of the time oral hypoglycemic are not enough to control fast plasma glucose and you need insulin if you want to do it. And speaking of the product, the, the supplement there, Kirlin, um, there's a few questions that came in um, about comparing it to uh, berberine. So basically, you know, how does Kirlin compare to berberine? How does it compare to the metabolic effects of berberine? berberine? So a few questions on that. Let me see if I can go back and clear that up. But basically, how does it compare or does it compare? How how the supplement compared to what to other drugs? How does that supplement, yeah, that Kirlin compared to berberine? Ah, other supplements. How does it compare to other? Yeah, yeah. And yeah. well, I yeah, yeah, I you know I read a lot about it, but I didn't. I I never had my own experience. One of the big problems with supplements is that we don't have good randomized, blind randomized control trials, which we now do with Curaline. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't tend to use supplement until several years ago. And I did it with very careful. I was very careful, you know, to make sure that whatever there is, there is not deleterious to the patient and that it has an effect. It seems that there are other good supplements as Beriberi or others, and I don't have an experience. Hmm. Um, that's, uh, there's a bunch actually too coming in, and you might have covered in the presentation, but well, I'll ask you anyway. Um, would you recommend this supplement for type 1 diabetics? Well, type 1 diabetics most of the time, and uh, you know, we, we don't exactly know the mechanism by which is of each of these supplements and, and work. And type 1 diabetes, most of the time, uh, their problem is uh, loss of beta cells. Insulin resistance, most of the time, is minor, and it's all, only because of hyperglycemia. And my feeling is that most probably supplements will not affect a patient with type 1 diabetes. I mean, they will not be deleterious but I don't think they will make a big difference. What I can say from my own experience in my own clinic is that we have a very good response in type two diabetic patients who are not using multiple daily insulin use, okay? And like me, I, I'm using two kind of drugs and it's making a huge difference for me. Uh, when you use it in patients who, who are treated with three or four day, times a day uh, insulin, long-acting and short-acting, uh, the effect was uh, much less, although there were type 2 diabetic patients with insulin resistance. Mm -hmm. So my feeling is that this is much, much, it suits much more patients with type 2 than it is with type 1. Okay, interesting. And then on along those lines too, is there any benefit to taking Kirlin for those who have no signs of diabetes or pre-diabetes? Would there be a benefit? Well, 
I cannot answer it. My, my, my tendency is not to use uh, supplements if you don't have any sign of diabetes or yeah. pre-diabetes. Uh, because, I mean, it's like using a drug when you don't have a disease. And, and when we did a randomized controlled trial on patients with tendency to develop diseases, most of the time, if they didn't have any sign of it, it didn't help them. Sometimes with the SGLT2, as I showed you today, uh, you can see that there will be patients who have diabetes and it will protect the heart or the kidney, but it will need about 300 patients to show an effect on one of them. So if you're a healthy person, most of the time, as much as I can say, supplement will not make the difference. And you know, with anything, whether it's a drug or a supplement, in order to really know that it is totally safe and not deleterious, you need to do, you need to give it to many thousands of people, let's say 100,000, 200,000 people, and follow them carefully over several years. And this has not been done with supplements. It has been done with drugs. And sometimes we find after FDA approved drug, after all the randomized control studies look wonderful, and then you follow a drug over several years, and suddenly you find that there is more, that the drug can be deleterious. And we have several drugs like that, that we learn only after they have been used by millions of people or hundreds of thousands of people. So that's why I'm not for giving supplements to a healthy person. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That definitely makes sense. Um, let's see what else we got here. So, um, why do you use the supplement after meals and not before or between meals to improve absorb absorption of plants? Well, this is a very good que uh, question, which I don't have an answer. And I'll tell you, <laughs> I, I want to tell you the following. My impression was that this supplement has effect on insulin resistance and also on beta cell function. Being like this, the rationale would be to give it before food and not after, okay? Like, but on the other hand, two things happen. First, the reason that it was suggested after was to reduce a gastrointestinal side effect. As you see with the metformin, you know, many times, we recommend metformin after you eat, not before. Now, the rationale is to give metformin before, because what this is doing, it's important the moment sugar starts to rise up. Now, what we found just by clinical inspection, and, and I don't know if it's true, is that this drug works better after food than before food. I can tell you about myself. I used to take it before half an hour or quarter of an hour before I ate. And I found that if I take it quarter of an hour to half an hour after I ate, or right after I ate, it works better. Now, this, this, is, not, this is not science, okay? This is clinical, uh, you know, this is what I learned from small amount of my, of my uh, clients. But I heard it from them that they see a better control of the blood glucose level when they take it after food. And I include patients with prediabetes. Even, you know, mm. when you have prediabetes, most of the time, even when you take drug, you don't see a big difference. If you take metformin or other drugs that do not cause, uh, that do not really increase uh, uh, insulin secretion, you will not see a big difference when your A1C is 6.2, 6.3. And yet, with this supplement, with the Cura line, this one, this is a full one. This is the empty one that I mm -hmm. use. Uh, you you do see a difference in blood glucose mm -hmm. level even in patients with prediabetes. Hmm. Do you have um, any experience with vitamin D in glycemic control, insulin resistance? Well, this is a very good question. But it's hard to answer. What we do in Israel, I actually give vitamin D to every one of my patients 
who do have no vitamin D. And we know that vitamin D can improve your Im uh, immune uh, status. Can even, even there are studies that demonstrate that using vitamin D uh, or those who take vitamin D will have less mortality, will have, will have better glucose control and so on. But if you look at randomized control studies, they didn't really show that if you have low vitamin D, you will, there will be a big difference if you take vitamin D. So I have no answer to that, but mm -hmm. my recommendation is to give vitamin D if you don't have, if you have low level of vitamin D. And there are more and more studies that show that those who have low vitamin D, mainly those who have less than 20 micrograms, versus those who have normal or relatively high, which is more than 40, and the risk of, of cardiovascular disease, the risk of mortality and so on, and most of the time is higher, okay? And there is controversial studies that show the opposite. There is one like this. So in general, my recommendation is to give vitamin D to those who need it. In our country, in spite of the fact that there is sunshine most of the days, <laughs> most of our people have uh, low vitamin D. Hmm. That's very interesting. I'm up in Canada right now and we have very minimal sun, I will tell you. <laughs> um, actually, a question did just come through is what dose of vitamin D do you recommend? How much vitamin D do you recommend? Oh. Um, so what I'm doing, I have, there are two ways. One way is to give vitamin D once a month. You can give, you know, what it, what a baby takes, which is 200, uh, 200 uh, units per, per, uh, uh, per drop. You can drink the whole bottle which means that you take around 70,000 each month. In our country, in Israel, for a reason which I cannot explain, they prefer to give a daily vitamin D. If I give a daily vitamin D, what I learned is that I have to give at least 3,000 a day, 3,000 to 5,000 a day for several months in order to take you from low vitamin D to normal or vitamin D. The risk for toxicity is very, very low. I never, I don't remember one of my patients who have an who have vitamin D above the, the reasonable level, which is a toxicity level. There's a couple questions that have come through um, on metformin. So um, this first one that came through is, if a client is on metformin AM and PM, what protocol can you suggest to use Kirilin to help reduce the use of metformin? Do you yeah, so. uh, to make it to do less metformin? Uh, metformin, in general, is a very good drug. The level of metformin that we suggest, if a patient do not have side effects, which can be diarrhea or abdominal pain, is up to 2,000, or in my country, 2,700 milligram a day. Uh, metformin, beyond the fact that it will reduce the risk to develop diabetes if you're pre-diabetes, mainly if you are young, or if you're a woman uh, who have gestational diabetes, or if you're obese, uh, beyond its effect, it have most probably quite other effects. For example, and there are signs that it can postpone dementia or Alzheimer. There are signs that it can protect against cancer. So we don't have a good randomized controlled trial, but if we look at population under metformin, and there are many observing, observing, observational studies, you can see that those under metformin are doing better when it comes to cardiovascular disease, when it comes to renal failure, 
You know, one of the mistakes of doctors in my country is that they say that metformin can accelerate renal failure. And this is totally wrong. If anything, the opposite. So this is a very good drug. In the United States, they are doing studies and they are looking whether this drug not only can protect can from cancer or turn cancer in from a wild cancer to, to less wild cancer, it can also uh, increase life expectancy. Now, this is all not totally proven, but if you look at metformin, there is no harm from this drug. That's why if you take metformin and you can take two a day, let's say two gram a day, I, th I know in the United States you have one gram, mm -hmm. and take two gram a day, it's better than one gram. I mean, if you take it, take two gram a day, as long as you don't have side effects. If you do have side effects like diarrhea, abdominal pain, sometimes a lower dose will will be okay without the side effect. With curing? What? With curing? They ask with curing. Also, metformin with curing. Ah, metformin with curing. Well, so I'm taking now two metformin, one SGLT2, which is called for SIGA, and six curing a day. Okay, and uh, I must admit that many times I don't remember exactly, so I take it just after I eat, okay? But I, I try to take it six times a day, sometimes I even take more, which is not recommended. And the advantage, as I, as I said in my lecture, take me for example, my A1C started to go up to above seven, and I want to be around six and a half or less than that. Now, if I would use any other drug that we have on the market, like limpurid, sulfonylurea, any kind of sulfonylurea, or any kind of thiazolidinedione that is called Actos in the United States, or any kind of other drug, the supplement, Curaline, is more effective than many of them and has the great advantage that there is no side effect. You don't gain weight with it. You don't do hypoglycemia with it. We, as, as I showed you, we had the, we were following patient. We got answers for more than 700 patients. And our impression was that curaline did not increase the risk to develop hypoglycemia at all. Now, I cannot promise it 100%, but I feel very safe when I add it to the treatment of my patient. Um, this last question, or one of the last questions that came through is, would Kirlin be recommended for gestational diabetes during pregnancy or after? Well, I don't know. I don't know. I think women, I think gestational diabetes, first is a very short thing. You know, it started when most of the time you are diagnosed when you are at the 26, 28 week of, of your pregnancy. And most of the time, diet plus metformin plus other drug that was followed, including sulfonylurea or insulin, will do very well. So, and we don't have enough experience with, with, although I'm sure it will work, but we don't have experience on the one hand. On the second hand, to a pregnant woman, I will be careful in adding something that we're not really checked in many, many pregnant women and was shown to be safe. So I would not recommend it to, to my uh, gestational uh, women uh, patients. Um, one more, let's try to get a couple, one more maybe in here and see. I'm very conscious of, of um, everyone's time. So this one longer question that came through, have you seen any clinical correlation between food sensitivity and insulin resistance and pre-diabetes? Perhaps the gut flora and better glycemic control? Is there any clinical correlation between food sensitivity? Between food. <laughs> uh, food. Well, you know, there are kind of diets which were shown to reduce insulin resistance. And one of the diets is the Mediterranean diet. The diet that actually came from our the countries around us and our country. 
And also, if you do keto ketogenic diet, sometimes you can see that after a short while, uh, there will be improvement in, in blood glucose control and seem to be also improvement in insulin resistance. And, but again, you know, the study that we're looking at insulin resistance, we're not accurate enough. There is not, I'm not aware of a study, for example, that did a glucose clamp in which you can really check, you know, when you give on one hand, you give glucose, on the other hand, you give insulin, IV, and you check how, how efficient is the body in using glucose, how much insulin you have to add in order to, and this gives you a very good idea about insulin resistance. I'm not aware of good studies that showed that there is a real reduction in insulin resistance in, in ketogenic diet. Okay, but I do, I, I am aware of studies that look at uh, IR and HOMA IR and demonstrated a difference. Okay, so the question, the answer is yes, most probably those diets reduce insulin resistance. You also don't know because in those diets, most of the time you reduce weight. And if you reduce several kilograms, you reduce insulin resistance. If you reduce your sugar, you reduce insulin resistance. For example, I showed when I was in Phoenix, Arizona, that when you use sulfonylurea, you reduce insulin resistance. I show it with, with a clamp that I mentioned, but we didn't know was this the reason? Was this a reason of the reduction in glucose that by itself increased insulin resistance, or was it a direct effect of sulfonylurea? So there is no clear-cut answer to that good yeah. question. <laughs> well, I want to maybe stop us here as we're getting to the top of the hour, and I'm conscious of your time and everyone who's joined us. I um, want to thank you. What a great presentation, full of massively valuable information and then this live q a having you here for this amount of time getting to go through some of the questions that have come through most of the questions that have come through is is amazing so we thank you so much um, for taking the time with us and we thank everyone also that attended today for taking the time as a last reminder you will get a um, access to this recording it's being recorded so everyone will get access through their email it lives on fullscript.com webinars as well and um, we will try to provide any resources we can in a follow-up along with this um, recording so thank you again for um, being here today and we hope uh, professor us and Kira life to have you um, do some more webinars with us in the future. Thank you for being such a good moderator. I enjoyed <laughs> oh, <that>. Thank you. <laughs> for oh, thank you. Easy for me. Thank you. Oh, great. Well, again, we hope to see you in the future then. Um, but for now, everyone have a great rest of the day and we'll see you soon.